Welcome everybody uh, to today's economic psychology seminar. Uh, we're absolutely delighted with today's speaker. Uh, before we uh, come to the speaker, I would just want to mention two things. So this economic psychology seminar is organized by the International Association for Research and Economic Psychology, YAREP. We have a journal and that journal currently has a really interesting um, special issue and uh, a call for special issues out and that is on the behavioral consequences of gender difference, which I think is really relevant to everybody who is here. So maybe consider uh, submitting your work to the journal, Economic Psychology. The second thing I wanted to mention is that soon uh, the conference organizers of next year's conference will announce registration. That will be in Dundee in Scotland, and we'll have fantastic uh, keynote speakers. One of them, actually, Professor Catherine Ecker. So if you're here, that suggests that maybe that conference might also be really interesting for you. So th thanks for being here. And particularly thanks for being here, Professor Catherine Ecker. So it's, it's a great pleasure to have you here. So the next step is that I will introduce you very briefly. Uh, I think most of the people here will know you very well, will know your work for many years. So Catherine Ecker is Sarah and John Lindsay Professor in Liberal Arts and University Distinguished Professor in the Department of Economics at Texas A&M University. And really to us, she's known as a household name in behavioral economics with so many really interesting areas of work of financial decision-making of the poor, charitable giving, really interesting, but maybe most famously on gender differences and risk-taking, uh, but gender differences in many relevant experimental economic uh, the, um, games. So we're really delighted to have you here. It's fantastic to have an expert in behavioral economics, especially experimental economics and lab experiments with us. We're absolutely delighted. Uh, thank you for being here. In terms of housekeeping, uh, please add your questions to the Q&A. Um, then we will be able to either unmute you or if you indicate that you don't want to be unmuted, then we can read out your question. Uh, but it would be nice to unmute a few people after the talk and we will stop uh, on the hour at the end of the next hour, depending on your time zone. Uh, with having said that, uh, Professor Eckel, it's really delightful. Delight, we're delighted that you're here and looking very much forward to your talk. If you want to share your screen, uh, that would be fantastic. I'll do that. Thank you. I just want to quickly say thank you, Leo and Carlos, and I'm just delighted to be here. Thanks a lot. There, is that correct? That's coming up great, thank you. All right. Well, uh, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for coming today. It's uh, wonderful to see some familiar names in the list of participants and uh, some new names as well. I'm really excited to be here to be able to talk about this research with you. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's something that I've been working on for a few years now, and uh, I'm. I mean, I hope that I hope that you enjoy it. Um, what we're talking about here um, is the gender leadership gap. So uh, Claudia Goldhan just won the Nobel Prize, and she taught us about the gender pay gap. And from her, we learned a great deal about why women and men earn different amounts of money in the labor market, all the different causes um, behind that. And she was a real pioneer, of course, but um, she hasn't focused so much on what we're interested in, which is the gender leadership gap. So we're interested in what's happening at the top. Uh, so women are underrepresented at the top. I think everyone knows this. So women are more than half of the US workforce, for example, but 35% of, but a whole 35% of leadership positions broadly defined. If you look at the very top, 10.4% of Fortune 500 CEOs in the US are women. That's uh, 52 human beings and 7% uh, of the European Fortune 500. This is the highest it's ever been. So it's certainly something to celebrate. Hooray, 10%. In, in the US Congress, women are 125 out of 440 representatives and 25 out of 100 senators. So that's you know a third to a quarter. It's um, it's Democrat heavy. So Democrats are twice as high for the Senate and three times as high for the House. 
Uh, women who do make it to the upper ranks of the corporate world are not promoted or compensated the same as men. There's quite a bit of evidence showing that for the same position, women receive lower earnings. And this, so the question that we have then is, uh, despite a lot of effort and a great deal of progress, this gap remains. Why does it remain? Well, when you step back from the problem and think about gender differences, um, I like to think about two ways in which we might look at this, or really three. So the first is whether there are gender differences, that is, are women different from men? Are they different in their preferences, for example? A lot of my work has focused on risk aversion, on altruism. Uh, many people have worked on competitiveness, and there's even a little bit of evidence on time preference. And these preferences can lead women to make different choices and these choices may give them different qualifications. Uh, another important point is that, that Claudia Golden makes repeatedly is that women may face different constraints because of their social or family situations. So that, those are ways in which women might make different choices. And arguably, if women are just making different choices, you know, the way economists look at things, if women are just maximizing their utility, then we don't have a problem to worry about, right? But another way of looking at it is to ask whether women are treated differently. So women might be treated differently because of stereotypes. There may be perceptions of gender roles and norms that, um, that constrain how women are perceived uh, and how they are evaluated. And it could be that there's just flat out discrimination. That is that people prefer male to female leaders. So another question we ask in this domain is what institutional factors might affect the gender gap? Something about the selection process or the way uh, um, firms are organized or the way people are recruited could affect the gender gap. So what about stereotypes? Well, um, I didn't create this. I pulled it off the internet, but I thought you might enjoy it. Uh, so here's some words that are used to describe male leaders. Game changer, innovator, dominate, winning, competitive, success, etc. <laughs> and for women, what are we women? Kind, creative, sassy, strong, passionate, determined. And these are very different words that are used to describe male and female leaders. Reflecting, I think, the differences in uh, stereotypes about male and female leaders. So this also inspired us a bit. Huh. Uh, so, and what about women being different? Well, we have, uh, I have a survey paper with uh, Olga Scherchkov that we published a few years ago, looking at um, preferences and differences in career choice by women and men. There's a lot of work on this question. Women are more risk averse, more loss averse, more collaborative, more altruistic, less competitive. Now, not every study finds these differences, but the weight of the evidence, I would say, is, um, is supports these differences. Uh, women, more recent work, women are less confident, less likely to self-promote, even when they know that they're right, even when they know that they're the highest performer, they know that they're the best. Women choose less risky, less competitive majors in, in areas of study, professions, careers, even compensation contracts. There's a, there's a study showing that women choose, women leaders choose more of their income as salary rather than as stock options, which makes them, makes their contracts less competitive and leads to a gender difference in, in, um, in compensation. And of course, as I mentioned before, women face tighter constraints. So women may prefer not to lead. So are women different? Well, women, you know, we made the case that because women are have different preferences and constraints, they may choose different qualifications. But it is the case lately that women are more likely to complete a bachelor's degree than men. However, women earn a lower proportion of, of um, STEM degrees, at least STEM advanced degrees. Um, 
however, they do lead men in some advanced degrees. So I'll just show you a little evidence about that, though you probably know it already. This is some user figures showing that women in the US are outpacing men in college graduation. Uh, the figure on the left is for adults age 25 and older. And this, um, this restricts it to ages 25 to 34. So you can see that women uh, are ahead of men in the proportion uh, earning a uh, graduate from college. Here's some information on doctoral degrees. Uh, and again, this is, this is US data. In, in business, in business degrees broadly, uh, men are earning more than half of the advanced degrees, the doctoral degrees, but in public administration, which uses roughly the same set of skills, uh, women dominate, um, which is quite interesting. And then the social and behavioral sciences just below that, more generally you see that, that women dominate. So women are clearly getting advanced degrees in more advanced degrees in some areas than, um, than men. We'll come back to this a little bit later. So with women getting all these qualifications, why hasn't there been more progress at the top? That's our question. And now we get to the possibility that women are treated differently. So these, um, these differences in treatment could be taste-based or belief-based. Taste-based would mean that people just don't like women to be leaders maybe because it violates social roles or social norms. Um, but the other is belief-based discrimination, that people may have biased perceptions and beliefs about women and how they are treated. And, and another question that we keep, you know, that we keep asking is whether the gender gap is a problem that still needs to be fixed, or is it just okay? And whether the answer to this question is going to depend on the underlying causes of the gender gap. If it's because people are making the choices that they want to make and everybody's happy with it, then you know maybe it's not a problem. But if it's due to bias, biases or discrimination or um, artificial barriers to women's success, then it's something that we should be thinking about and addressing as economists and as psychologists. Okay, how do you study the gender gap? We're, we're all interested in the same questions and um, people from different fields, even different subfields within economics use different approaches to um, study the gender gap. Most research and including most of Claudia Golden's research um, uses observational data from firms and government oops, and large scale surveys um, and these, uh, this work documents gender differences and gives some hints about why, but it's hard to uncover uh, causal relationships. The problem is that too many things change at once in any given situation for us to understand what's going on. We can't dissect all the forces that might be producing gender differences in outcomes. Um, so there's preferences, there's social pressure, there's differential treatment. And uh, it's really hard to take these apart from observational data. And that's why we take this problem into the lab. So in the lab, we can, we can develop what I call experimental models. And we can use these experimental models together with randomization to, to try to really focus in on some of the potential causes of the gender gap and try to understand what's going on how all the pieces are working together uh, and uh, what and and that allows us to try to figure out what might be the most effective interventions if indeed interventions are needed okay um i'm going to tell you about two studies you know as usual uh, we were talking about this just before the seminar yet as usual we have a large question what causes the leadership gap the gender leadership gap. And what I'm going to show you about are a couple of um, quite well-defined and, and narrow studies. So, but that's the strategy. That's what we need to do in order to know anything is we have to focus down on something uh, specific. So I'm going to tell you about these two studies. I will mention, we of course, not the only people working on this problem. 
And there are many, many very uh, talented and dedicated people doing wonderful work on gender and leadership. So, but I'm just going to tell you what we're doing. And that's, um, th these are the two studies that I'll be focusing on. Okay, the first study is It Pays to Be a Man, and these are my co authors. The goal in this project is to just isolate gender. And in order to do that, we're going to build an experimental model that removes or holds constant all the other factors that we can think of. Um, and what we're going to focus on then is gender-based perceptions of leaders and gender differences in how they are evaluated and compensated. I like to talk about um, making experimental models. So the exercise of designing an experiment, of determining what's gonna be in your experiment and what's not gonna be in your experiment, is very, I, I think, closely parallel to the decision that formal theorists make when they're trying to design a formal model to capture a particular situation in the world. So we have to decide what to leave in. We have to decide what to take out, what to abstract away from. And we end up with a world, an experimental model, that's that's quite different from the um, the motivating situation, but that allows us to focus on uh, the, a few key elements at a time. So the thing that we want to figure out uh, the most. So in this experiment, we had some design decisions to make. We wanted to remove everything that might affect leadership success. So we really limit what the leader can do. There's no risk taking, there's no competitiveness, there's no ability involved in what the leader has to do. The leader has a very simple job to do, and I'll tell you about it. We want to remove any selection effects. That is, our leader is not selected by any process. The leader is a random leader. Uh, we do this in order to remove any selection-based differences between the men and women who are selected for leadership jobs. Uh, the leaders in our experiment merely occupy the leadership position. They have no special information. All the information that they have is readily available to the followers. And there's no agency problem. The leaders' interests are perfectly aligned with the interests of their followers. So you might say, we've gotten rid of all the interesting stuff. <laughs> what have we got left to look at? Well, this is what we do. We take a simple coordination game that mimics production and that's known to respond really well to leadership. That is, leadership largely solves the coordination problem in this game, and we know that. So um, in each period, a subject selects a personal fee. So I put the personal fees down, down the side here. And the minimum personal fee selected by anyone in their group determines the per group member award reward, and the subject's earnings are the group reward minus the fee that they selected. So this is one person's decision, uh, taking into account all the possible minimum fees in the group. And as you can see, there's an, there's an equilibrium for any commonly chosen fee. Um, so if everybody chooses zero, then everybody earns one, and no one has an incentive to move unilaterally. The best equilibrium is this one, where everybody chooses a fee and their net earnings for all the group members are uh, a fee of three, and the net earnings for all the members is two. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so it's a very simple game. We put people in groups and, uh, and they play the game for a while. The leader's taken aside before the game starts and there's one leader for every session. The leader's taken aside and given the same instructions that the group members get and uh, their questions are answered and we inform them that they're going to give a short message to the other subjects about how to play the game. And the message is, we all need to choose a fee of three to maximize earnings. And we let them use their own words, but this is what they say. We all need to use to choose a fee of three. So that's what that's the leader's job. Uh, this doesn't require any skill. It, it doesn't require them to figure things out. It doesn't require anything except their ability to speak out loud. 
then they can also become a. Uh, so in phase one of the game, people are put in groups of five. They each make an independent choice of a fee and they play for 10 periods with a fixed group, no leader. Then between period 10 and 11, the leader enters the lab, walks to the front of the room, gets up on a platform and says, everybody needs to choose three. You should all choose three. Three is what you should choose. Definitely choose three. Everything will be better. The groups are reformed and they play for 10 more periods with new fixed groups. So that's it. Now, here's what happens. A leader really improves um, coordination. So first here on the left, we have the situation with no leader. These first two columns are the groups that, going to that are going to end up with a female leader. So in the first phase of their game, there's no leader. So a well, female leader, no leader. And then the female leader enters. So green is good. That's people choosing three. And you can see that the proportion of people picking green goes way up. Picking uh, three goes way up. Um, and these are the groups that are going to have male leaders. And you can see that beforehand, they're a little different, but there's no significant difference between them. And then when the male leader comes up to the front, the male leader says, choose three, and everybody chooses three. Uh, these look a little different, uh, but with but they're not as, they're not significantly different. So the proportion of people choosing three is not uh, not significantly different between um, the two sets of sessions. Okay, so the leader really is able to improve coordination, male or female. Now, after this is done, the subjects know what they've earned. They know what happened without a leader. They know what happened with the leader. We ask them an open-ended question. We ask, what impact do you believe the leader had on your earnings? And these responses are scored by independent raters that we hire who are blind to the leader gender. And each response is scored on a scale from negative to positive. Um, the followers, so the outcome of this evaluation process is that the followers consistently rated male leaders more highly with respect to their impact on the followers' earnings. So. Everybody comes in, the leaders do the same stuff. They're equally effective, but the followers rate the male leaders as more responsible, more highly um, having more impact on their earnings. In case you wanna see the distribution, here's the impact, the distribution of the impact scores from minus five to plus five. The good news is that the subjects do think for the most part that uh, the leader, positively impacted their earnings, except look at all these negative things for the women leaders. Um, so the, the this is a histogram. These are the number of subjects choosing each thing. And um, the, so you, you can see that there are a lot of high scores for everyone, but there are more low scores for women than for men. Then the, um, the followers vote on the leader's bonus. So it's not free to give the leader a bonus. They have to pay for it. And they vote, uh, they each choose um, a bonus and we pick the, the bonus that the, the majority supports. So the average bonus is 17% higher for men than for women. For the same performance, the bonus is higher. Uh, so we, uh, we can control for some stuff. We can control, we also have other ratings of the leaders so we can control for uh, their leadership attributes, their attractiveness. Um, no matter what we control for, the male leaders receive a significant bon bonus premium. Um, and um, and so that's what we found in the first study. We find that male leaders are not more effective leaders. We find no difference in male and female leaders' attributes or attractiveness. I didn't show you that, but it's true. We found... Um, that followers rated male leaders impact significantly higher and male leaders received a bonus premium of 17%. Sad, huh? So the next step was to think about what factors might mitigate the gap. Um, there are a lot of possible things we could look at and we will, you know, but it's the lab. We can look at one thing at a time. We got really interested in the setting 
So we wanted to ask if the setting more closely matches gender stereotypes, can this mitigate perceptions of the impact and rewards? I don't know what happened. We have a typo there. Okay, so study two is the gender leadership gap in competitive and cooperative settings. And here are my co-authors. Why look at the competitiveness of the job? Well, we know from other lab experiments and from field data that women are more likely to choose to work in less competitive or more cooperative environments. And not that every woman does this, but on average. Uh, women get a larger share of advanced degrees in cooperative settings. So what I mentioned before, in business management, men get more degrees, but in nonprofit management or public and men, still management, women get more of the degrees. Uh, less is known about how the job setting affects leadership. So we exogenously vary the environment in a novel game. Uh, we manipulate the incentive structure of a, of, a, of a game that's pretty well known for employees to make it more cooperative or more competitiveness. And this is just kind of in a small way. And we keep the, um, the leader's incentives constant. We're interested in whether female leaders are more effective in a cooperative setting. We're interested in whether they are evaluated on a par with men. And we're interested in whether women are more willing to lead, though I'm not going to spend much time on that today. That's um, something we're still exploring. Design features, again, we're designing an experimental model. And what we want is a game where the competitive and the cooperative games are very, very similar. So that we're sure that it, it's this aspect of the game that's making a difference. This took us a while to figure out, but we came up with one. I hope you like it. We did some variations on the centipede game, which was invented by these guys. Um, in the leadership, we have, um, we need a selection process with male and female leaders. We need a way to reveal the leader's gender because we're we're not doing this with one leader walking into the room anymore. We're doing it online. Uh, we need a detailed evaluation. We need a measure of beliefs about the leader effectiveness and a measure of willingness to lead and why. So these are the design elements that we need. Okay, so here's our game. We have, um, this is a centipede game. You may be familiar with it from uh, from your courses in game theory. They're decision nodes. They're, they're, they're two people playing the game. And at the first node, the first player can either stop or pass. If they stop, the blue player earns four and the red player earns one. If they pass, then it's player two's turn, the red player's turn. And if player two stops, then, um, the blue player gets two and the red player gets seven. So you can see what's happening to the payoffs here. The high payoff alternates. And then we're back to the blue player at node three. The blue player can either pass or stop. And if they stop, they earn 10 and the red player earns three and on we go. Uh, so there are two, there's these two players. The blue makes the odd decisions and the red makes the even decisions and the total payoffs increase as you go along. The Nash equilibrium of the game by backward induction is that both players should stop at the earliest opportunity because they don't want to risk reducing their earnings by going to the next node. And uh, so we should get an equilibrium at one, at node one with uh, the first player exiting. But of course, subjects are smarter than that and they, they manage to get more money out of the experimenter by passing. So somehow they manage to to play the game as so many games like this and and they don't stop at the beginning. Uh, so there's some possibility that they can coordinate and keep going in this game. Again, we have we introduce leadership. In this case, the leader is a third party, not one of the two players. And the leader's job is to make suggestions. So it's leading by suggestion. In our competitive environment, we have uh, the game has eight rounds. One player receives increasingly an increasingly larger share of the joint payoff. The, the total payoffs are maximized if both choose always to pass. They get all the way to the end here with payoffs of 28 and nine. 
We introduce a random end to the game so that either player could end up with a larger share. And we do this based on what people have done previously uh, because it mimics uncertainty in the kind of underlying settings that this is designed to capture. So for example, R&D, research and development is a, is a, a game that's structured in kind of this way where people can uh, exit at different points and take their marbles home with them. Um, and there's some uncertainty about whether the game is going to continue. So um, anyway, that's the structure of the game. And in the cooperative setting, what we do is we just change a few little things. The game is the same. It's identical if either player chooses to stop. But the the total payoffs are and the total payoffs are still the same. But there's some things that are different. So these points where the computer might randomly end the experiment. If the computer randomly ends the experiment, they get equal payoffs. And if they get all the way to the end, again, the payoffs are equal. So the simple change in the distribution of the payoffs at some of the nodes, that's that's how we make the game cooperative. So you can see that it's a pretty small tweak to the game. Uh, we choose female leaders randomly. So we just select leaders randomly. We don't mention anything about gender. We select leaders randomly from the applicant from the uh, subject pool. And uh, we reveal gender to the followers by using a nickname procedure. So the nickname is not the person's own name, but once someone is identified as a leader, they have an opportunity to choose a nickname. Only the female leaders can only choose female nicknames and the male leaders can only choose male nicknames. So that's how we, that's how we reveal it. Um, we have a detailed evaluation of the followers a measure of beliefs that's incentivized about the leader effectiveness and a measure of willing to lead and why. This willingness to lead is elicited before the game, before once they it's elicited after the instructions, but before the roles are identified. And, uh, and we ask them if they're willing to lead and why. So that their answer doesn't affect the probability that they're chosen, though they might... Um, I think it does. Okay, result one, uh, male and female leaders are equally effective in both institutions. So, uh, sorry, let me just review for a second. The So the point of the game is to get as far as you can. And the leaders, what the leaders are doing is they're trying to suggest that players go farther and farther into the game so that the pie gets bigger and bigger. And what I'm gonna show you is the average exit time. So in, um, in the competitive in institution, we get exits that are happening around round four, and there's no significant difference between male and female leaders. In the cooperative institution, they're, they're exiting later. You know, the way we've manipulated the payoffs, uh, if the computer ends the game, it's less risky in the sense of variability of payoffs if the computer ends the game in this um, setting. And so we expected that uh, that the games would go on a little longer. But the key thing is that there's no gender difference in performance. You can see that there really isn't. Male and female leaders are equally successful. Okay. On the other hand, <laughs> female leaders are evaluated more negatively in the competitive institution. So this replicates the result we had before that women are evaluated more negatively. Uh, but interestingly, um, we've made the um, we've made this disappear, the difference in evaluations, we've made it disappear in the cooperative institution. So uh, women and men remember are equally successful, equally productive in the two institutions. But in the cooperative institution with just these little changes, uh, male and female um, leaders are evaluated the same now. Okay, now the bonuses, um, the payment adjustments, the bonuses are also, again, they have to pay to, um, to give someone a bonus. And the payment adjustments are also lower for women in the competitive treatment, uh, plus 19, for male leaders, so they can reward or penalize leaders. And the male leaders get a little bonus and the female leaders get a little penalty. 
And this is caused by the male followers who have the biggest difference between their rewards for the male leaders, plus 53, and their rewards for the female leaders, minus 32. That's a difference of 85 cents. So a pretty significant difference in the bonus. Okay, what about willingness to lead? Well, women report a lower willingness to lead in both environments. Men are consistently more willing to lead than women in both. So we had hoped that we could not only break the evaluation um, difference, but that we could also get women to be more willing to lead, to, to um, accept a leadership position in the cooperative institution, but that didn't happen. And in, in fact, the gap is um, both groups are a little bit more willing to lead in the cooperative institution, but the, the uh, gender difference remains. And if anything is a bit larger and more significant in the cooperative institution. You see the men like leading, they like to lead in the cooperative institution. So that, uh, that was not uh, what we expected, um, but that's why you run experiments is to find out the answer. Okay, so what are the takeaways from this one? Uh, from this one, we know that um, men and women are equally effective in this in these simple games. And I didn't show you this, but they're also ex ante believed to be equally effective. That is um, the predicted, we incentivize, we elicit a predicted ending time for the male and female leaders, and there's no difference in that predicted ending time. Uh, female leaders are penalized in evaluations and bonuses in the competitive environment only, despite being equally effective as the male leaders. So the good news there is by introducing a cooperative environment, one that is more consistent with the stereotypes about female leaders, we are able to get rid of the difference in evaluation and bonuses conditional on performance. However, women are still substantially less willing to become leaders in both environments, irrespective of, of uh, which environment we put them in, and even in the cooperative settings. So our results suggest that a cooperative setting and institutional change toward a more cooperative setting can help to close the gender gap in evaluation, but not the willingness to lead. Okay. So where are we? Well, study one showed us that when women are equally effective by design, they're evaluated lower and rewarded less. Study two replicates this for competitive environments, but shows that a more cooperative environment can eliminate the gender gap. So the environment can affect the way in which women are evaluated and rewarded. And that's the contribution there, that's the news. Uh, the, what is the implication um, well, I think the implication is that we have to be careful in evaluating people to ensure that objective criteria are used. I mean, we can, so if we had looked at, for example, if we had evaluated leaders based on the increase in earnings of the followers, then that would have, or if you can think of that as, as, as paralleling productivity, if we looked at the productivity of the followers, that would have been an objective measure and those would have been the same for male and female leaders. But if we allow subjective evaluation, that is people just saying what they think the leader had to do with, um, with their earnings and their, their, um, their own performance, then those subjective evaluations penalize women, especially in less gender typical roles. So I think that that's a thing that we can we can start to educate management about and um, maybe uh, help improve the, the content of, of evaluations. So we started with a really big question and we came down to some small questions. Uh, and then we have to step back out and see what we think we learned. So there are many things, there are many co things, causal potential causal components that, um, that produce the gender leadership gap. We're using our tool, experimental models, 
to focus on just a few things. So we 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 hold a lot of things constant and we're able to isolate and focus on evaluation and rewarding. Now, that's not to say that evaluation and rewards are the only things that matter. And, and in fact, uh, the selection process is certainly very important. Uh, I would never say that it isn't. And that's something that we are hoping to turn to next is to look um, look more at the selection process. So, but anyway, in this setting, we find a strong evidence of the, the gender evaluation gap when there's no difference in performance. Uh, this is reduced or eliminated in a cooperative institution. So that shows that there are things that we can change that can fix this. And we're able to suggest some ways though we haven't tested them in which evaluation could be improved, which might help and close um, the gender gap. So just to, just to wrap up, let's say there, you know, we're making progress. So we're making progress and progress is good. And the more progress we make, the more we will make, I think. So just to get back to the women CEOs, this is what the path has looked like. You know, it, it's really um, increased. The proportion of women CEOs in the Fortune 500 has really increased. Now, it's still only 10%, but it's definitely better than it was even just a few years ago. I also want to mention some follow-up material so that you can, uh, if you're interested in this, you can uh, dig into it a little bit further. The survey articles by Olga and me and another survey we did on the current state of gender of gender and leadership in experiments. And that, that covers uh, the wonderful work of a lot of other people and not just ourselves. And then there are books that you should all read. You should all read Claudia Goldman's book. It's wonderful. And uh, this one on the No Club, I'm sure that many of you know about this, uh, by Linda Babcock, um, Brenda Pazer, Lise Vesterlund, and Laurie Weingart. Lise Vesterlund has been traveling around doing the famous author tour on this one. And the idea here is that uh, women are more likely to be asked to do tasks that are not rewarded. So that's a, another aspect of selection that that is um, is very interesting. They have a number of suggestions for how to fix that. And then there's Iris's book on um, on what works in within organizations. She tests a bunch of different things within organizations. I highly recommend her work. Okay, I'll leave you with um, my wonderful co-authors uh, and uh, hope that you have questions and suggestions and uh, ideas that you can send along to us. Thanks. Fantastic. You'll get a round of applause from everybody at home. You can't <laughs> see it, but that, that's that's really great. Thanks, thanks a lot. That was fantastic. I think uh, we really try to have a cooperative environment in these seminars, so we need a <laughs> who hopefully then won't uh, look look bad upon. Uh, the well, first... I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> uh, the, Laura, do you want to ask, ask the first question? Um, I will try to unmute you, and then you can uh, give your first question, Laura if you're okay with that. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Catherine, for an interesting Hi, Laura. Hi. <laughs> uh, one question that I thought you were going to get to, but I don't think you actually did, was I was curious, do you see does this vary by the makeup of the group's gender? Um, you know, sort of my thought process here is about the idea that, you know, that um, maybe groups of women judge women differently versus groups of men or something like that. Yeah, we don't have a lot of evidence of that. So um, most of the effects that we see come from both male and female um, followers. There, there are some uh, some patterns in that part of the results, but you, you know nothing that's that's really clear enough for us to be able to conclude much. It's certainly not true that women don't do it. <laughs> women okay, well, evaluate men higher than men, also. Yeah, they do. Okay, and um, we have uh, two questions here that I just merged together there from the chat. The first one was uh, just a question whether all the men were straight in the experiment. And the second question on, were you able to see which gender were more likely to be underestimate, to underestimated women leaders? Was it mostly yeah. for both or even women? Well, as I mentioned, there's some, there's some um, additional information in the paper on that, but we don't see any really clear differences in in male and female followers um 
so nothing that you could you could say that's conclusive uh, and i think that we had three or four out of our several hundred people who reported being um gay or non-binary yeah so relatively low not enough to uh to not enough to do any statistics on these um, uh, were Australian subjects uh, recruited uh, last year. Great. Um, Anna Bernard, do you want to answer, ask you the next question? Hi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, it was kind of the same question. Thank you, Karen, for the very interesting uh, research. But maybe I can ask another question, which is, uh, that relates to, so, so typically in the, in the experiments that you presented, Anytime you're the leader is is a random assignment, right? Do you expect that to be kind of different? I'm trying to link that to the, the this old literature on the, the effect of quotas um, for this type of, of positions. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't any... quite understand. I didn't quite understand what you said that you're trying to link it to what? The literature on the effect of quotas. Um, on the quotas, right. Right. So kind of how quotas can backlash because um, people might think that women are, are in, in those positions and they don't deserve it. Um, so I was wondering whether you have any kind of insights on how they are perceived about the deservingness to be in the leader in those experiments and whether you are considering manipulating that aspect. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. So we have some work that we did um, a few years back on on social status and leadership so what what we did was we had um, groups in a network with a central player that was the leader so it was leadership by example not leadership by suggestion or anything so uh, they could just observe the people around the periphery could observe the leader and could follow them and we had um, we gave them a quiz at the beginning and we selected the leader in one group based on whether they scored the highest on the quiz. And the other leader was whether they scored the lowest on the quiz. So, uh, and, and what we found was that the high status leader was actually not a very good leader. They, they were kind of lazy and they just sort of picked something in the middle and something that wasn't very costly for them. And everybody did exactly what they did. <laughs> everybody followed them. And the lower status leaders, um, they uh, they tried really hard. They tried really hard. They you know, kept trying to signal to do the right thing, and and nobody paid any attention to them. They had essentially no effect on the on the followers' behavior. So, how the leader is selected, the bottom line there is that how the leader is selected is extremely important, regardless of gender. And uh, if there's a gender component to that, it may be that. That the that the selection process is um, judged or evaluated differently. So, this is something that we haven't explored in the gender difference um, environment, and something that we really would like to explore. And um, of course, you know, send me your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Thanks a lot. Um, next question on on the nicknames, Katharina Werner. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Catherine. Thanks Hi. a lot for your inspiring talk. Yeah, so my question is whether or uh, among which names the leaders were able to pick their nickname, how long the list was or what the selection was, and whether you've checked whether you find any differences with respect to, first of all, how um, followers rated uh, leaders differently with different names or also whether certain names were more, more popular than others, because I have a joint study with Bettina Rottenbach and Susanna Grundmann in which we show that there are differences in how different first names are rated uh, with regard oh. to competence and leadership skills and so on. Oh, how interesting. Oh, I'll, I'll have to, uh, maybe you could send me that. I'd love to see it. Uh, we picked popular female first names. So we just picked them based on popularity. We uh, we didn't uh, we didn't um, and there were, the list was I can't remember five or eight names long, not super long, um, and uh, we have not tested for differences associated with the particular names. Uh, I mean everybody knows that they're nicknames in the 
in the game. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, but I'd love to see your work on it. Please send yeah, it to me. I'll send it to you uh, because we even find among very popular names, we find differences. So I'll oh, send it wonderful. To you. Wonderful. I'd love to see that. Very good. That's a good connection. Anna Ressi, she can't unmute yourself, so, so I will uh, read out. In study two, when participants were asked whether or not they want to be a leader, were they already aware of the whole procedure? So yes. Did... Okay, that's a yes. Very good. Yes, so it happened, it happened after the instructions. So they had seen the instructions for the game. Uh, they knew what the game was, and, uh, and, and then we asked them if they wanted to lead. Well, we told them that the leader was selected randomly, but you know, who knows what they thought about it. We didn't ask them. Yeah, and they knew about the bonus and that they could make some money with the bonus as well. Yeah, they knew the incentive structure for the leader. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah, I think that's that's that question. Uh, Davut, Akrabar, um, Davut, maybe you want to unmute yourself for your next question. Can you uh, speak if you can you unmute yourself? Yeah, still muted. Still muted. Davut. Um, I will just read out the question. Uh, did you also ask the participants whether they had previous experiences with female or male leadership that may influence their opinion? We did not. You did not. Yeah, okay. I am that would is in the library as well. Um okay, I have another anonymous question. Uh somebody had read studies about stereotypes of different race is also causing differences on leadership and results of their leadership skills. For example, Asians are considered poor re lead leaders. Uh, as you mentioned, we have Australian participants. Uh did race matter? Um you know, they don't know the race of their leader. Yeah, because that the nickname procedure masks any communication of race. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would have a question, if, if, I, if I may, um, and that is about the practical relevance. You know, you said one of the solutions would be to change institutions from co competitive to cooperative. Oops, we lost Leo, or I did. Yeah, I think we just lost Leo because I also lost him. Uh, I'm not uh -huh. sure what he was going to uh, to ask, but I had a similar question on that. I mean, you the... hinted that cooperative versus competitive. So, Leo, we lost Makes you for a oh, bit. Can you state your question again? Okay. Apologies. Maybe uh, 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 coordination problem right now, Leo. Please repeat your question. Apologies. Yeah, that was, might be the internet. Um, I was wondering about whether it's possible in the real world to change a given competitive environment into a cooperative environment, or whether it's more the case that an environment is either cooperative or competitive and that you cannot really change it when you move your insights to the real world. Yeah, so there's a lot of work in the management literature about how um, how organizations and describe themselves. So in virtually every organization and every workplace, people essentially work in teams. And so there are cooperative and collaborative elements in, in every type of work. So, but, and you can change the perception of the cooperativeness or competitiveness in part by emphasizing different elements within a given organizational structure. Uh, but, uh, but another way is just to actually change some of the incentives. So, uh, I, I would, you know, I would want more supporting evidence from the lab before I, I suggested that a firm actually change their incentive structure. That would be a big thing to ask a firm to do. Uh, but I think that um, that just describing the organization a little differently can uh, can do most of the work. Again, we haven't tested it, but that's that's my impression. That's very good, Jan. We should describe the seminar series as a collaborative and have a indeed husband. indeed we should we should uh, carlos you have yeah uh, i mean related to that at the beginning you hinted that the uh, field differences between taking jobs in public administration and in management and uh, you said i mean it's the same set of skills most of the time 
but it's not the same collaborative versus competitive framework. I mean, public administration mm -hmm. is precisely where you would think that you are removing part of the competitive element, which is completely unavoidable in management because at exactly. the end of the day, you're competing in a market. So do you mm -hmm. think that those differences that you find in the field uh, are related to the collaboration versus competition view or perception? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So it seems that manage, managing people, managing projects and managing people is, I mean, those are the common elements across business management and public management, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems like the managers are doing a lot of the same stuff, maybe with a different objective, profit versus something else. Um, but I think that the impression is that um, the work is more collaborative and more publicly oriented in, in public admin type jobs. So there's quite a lot of, of evidence now showing that that people who plan to enter public administration, nonprofit, um, that sector versus the for-profit sector have different preferences. So people who are in different uh, educational institutions that feed into for-profit and nonprofit organizations, the people in their programs have different preferences. Uh, and there's also evidence that the selection process, how these people are hired, selects more for particular types of preferences uh, so that, that more competitive people are selected for business positions and more co cooperative people are selected for nonprofit positions. So uh, this is this is a very rich area to study, and I think one where there's a lot more interesting work to do. And I hope to do some of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. We are almost out of time. We have two questions that I might just read out and see whether you have a quick response to that. Uh, sure. Henry was uh, shocked by the discrimination against females in the bonus payment system and is wondering whether women would be discriminated against in a pure dictator setting as well. Ah. Well, um, in, in, in our experiments, what we see is that um, women give away more than men do. But I'm not sure... So I think that there's some evidence showing that people give more to the opposite sex in the dictator setting, that women give more to men and men give more to women, but I'm not 100% certain about that. So I'm sure we can look it up. Yeah, that's great. And then the last one, Sarah Mustafa Zade. Uh, in the literature, it is usually considered that women are risk averse. Do you think this risk aversion can be caused by this penalized outcomes that you found and we can observe in real life situations? Yes, I, I do wish we had asked women what they expected to happen. Uh -huh. So we didn't ask the women leaders if anything about their beliefs or their expectations. And of course, they only saw their own rewards. And so they didn't know what the men were getting. Right. So that's uh, that's something, you know, there's never I've never done a study where there wasn't something I wish I'd asked. And that's uh, I wish I'd asked that. Hmm. Fantastic. So that's that's the look to the future. And that's the great last sentence. So thanks a lot. Thanks. And another round of applause. I'm sure everybody appreciates that a lot. Professor Eichel, that was fantastic. Thank that you. Was, we're really looking forward to hear you again at the Dundee conference in August uh, next year. And thanks again from uh, Carlos, myself and the whole economic psychology seminar, serious crowd from Yarab. So thanks a lot. And thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for coming today. Thank you. And remember that the next uh, seminar is on January 22nd by Carsten Droy. We hope to see you all there again. Thank you, Catherine. It has been a pleasure. Right.